Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the 6.5 Podcast. I'm your host today, Daniel Newman, Principal Analyst, Founding Partner at Futurum Research, joined by my always esteemed co-host, partner in crime, more insights and strategies, CEO, Chief Analyst extraordinaire, Forbes columnist, and all-around great guy, Patrick Moorhead. 6.5 is live, and not only are we live, but we're we are simulcasting into a new channel. So not only is it Twitter, not only is it Facebook, YouTube, of course, the Spotify's and all the other places that we like to provide our big tech analysis, but now we're doing call-in, Pat, because after a call-in with the all-in guys, you are all-in on call-in. Um, great, inter- great interview, by the way, with David Sachs. How are you doing today, buddy? Good, good. Uh, this is my favorite part of the week, and it is exciting to simulcast to uh, something new here. We'll see how it goes. I, I think there might be a little bit of echo, but uh, maybe we can work on that next time. Um, you know, the 6.5 podcast is all about, you know, giving the, the analysis of what's going on in the tech space. Not a lot of news, just enough news to set the tone. Um, and the show is for information and entertainment purposes only. So while we do talk about publicly traded companies, please do not take anything that we say as investment advice. Uh, one thing I am... Um, uh, that I do think I need to point out is uh, the name of the company, Daniel, is More Insights and Strategy. Uh, we only have we have multiple insights, but only one strategy. Okay, <laughs> so uh, let let's just nip this in the bud. After after okay? uh, what knowing you for six years and your company name never changed, the fact that I continue to get this wrong from time to time makes me think you need to change your name. Um, you know, maybe it's time, you know, after 10 years that uh, we actually, uh, that I actually do that. So I'm joking aside, I, I love you, man. And I know that deep down that just set your craw. Like this is like this sets the whole tone of this entire podcast wrong because, you know, I learned early in my career that you want to, you don't need to get a lot of things right, but you get people's names right. You know, when you call people the wrong name, I get David a lot. Um, yeah. And it really bugs me. And it doesn't matter what comes after that. But when someone emails me and says, hey, David. And it's not like my name is obscure. I mean, my name is Dan. It doesn't get much more generic than Dan, except maybe David, but people still miss it. Anyways, I'm very sorry. This is a public service announcement. I am apologizing to you, Patrick, for getting your company name wrong. I mean, good gosh. You know what? Let's dive in. Let's dive in and knock this out. I am getting some feedback uh, from some folks that says there is some echo on call-in. So... I we're, think, we're trying to work around it, right? I mean, we're, yeah. we're we turn the volume down, but in the app, you can't turn it completely off. It requires that it seems to have a lowest level of volume because I keep hitting the down and it will not let me turn the audio on your end off. So I'm still hearing myself. So what oh, do I know? There's David Axelrod. Hey. All right. Let's dive into this show. Uh, please uh, deal with this. Hey, maybe... Uh, Colin can provide a uh, filter next time for uh, for feedback. But uh, no, let's dive right in. So uh, David Sachs did uh, announce officially uh, uh, Colin, which is a social podcasting platform. Uh, it was in beta, and I had used it uh, used it a couple times. But uh, I think the first thing that that comes into everybody's um, mind is, hey, uh, how is this different from from other uh, properties uh, out there that might have started and it might have gone uh, might have gone uh, stale. And I think we all know which one we're talking about. Clubhouse. When's the last time you saw Clubhouse uh, pop up in your uh, Twitter? Um, if you're actually asking me that question, Pat, I it was like the rage for like a week. I mean, this, this thing reminded me of like Ello. Remember the Ello, the social network that like sure. became a thing. Um, makes me wonder about injuries and Horowitz is three times marking up the value of, of Clubhouse too between <laughs> its inception and now. And now I don't even hear about it. I don't. I, I don't hear about it, Pat. Yeah. So uh, a couple differences. So first of all, it on um, Clubhouse, you have to be there live, right? And it's not recorded. So if you're at work, and this thing pops up, guess what? You're you're out of luck. And there is value in that immediacy. I, I totally get that. But uh, I got off it because the shows were never in my time zone, right? So this 
uh, is a very easy platform. And I do think that when it comes to uh, podcasting, there's a lot of value. And I think the, 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 the initial value is the editing. So if you can imagine, so we do this recording and then about uh, a one to two minutes later, a transcript pops out and I can instantly go in and Colin uh, pulls out things like ums and errs and you knows, okay? Mistakes that I make all the time. Also, you know, that little chit chat we had beforehand, if we wanted to snip that out before we just got, got right into it, all you have to do is touch the words and then go away. And then at the end, you, you publish it and it gets sent out with its own link. You can promote it pretty much, pretty much everywhere. But the cool part about this is it's, it's social. Like I can see what you listen to. You can see what I listen to and it helps kind of cut through the cruff. And that's something that, uh, things like Apple podcast is missing. Like you have no idea what your friends are, are listening to. So, I think there's uh, some in initial uh, value here that uh, that that you know I think is is super exciting, and I did get the chance to uh, talk to David Sachs, interview him, and uh, I didn't just ask him about Colin. I mean, I was asking about China, uh, deficit spending, uh, what's new in SaaS, uh, and his favorite uh, investments, and I thought that was going to be a toughie, but. Uh, and pure David Sachs um, uh, style, you know, he turned it into which which one of his investments are farthest along, <laughs> uh, which I thought was uh, pretty uh, pretty clever. But check out the full interview on uh, Forbes.com. Yeah, absolutely, Pat. I thought it was great. Uh, you know, you and I are both fans of the All In Pod. We enjoy the conversation. We definitely love the fact that uh, that these gentlemen are so willing to really express whatever they're thinking. And Colin is super cool. I'm excited to learn more about it. Let's jump in to the second topic, Pat. Um, five nines. So five nines, uh, five nines. Five, I'm just going to say all the names wrong today. Five just nines. Just add an S to everything. Call it Collins, HPEs, yeah, Collins, and Google's. Listen, man, I'm telling you, I'm hearing an echo. The echo is adding an S to my Tell you what, you want me to, uh, is the echo bugging? You want me to shut it down? Ah, no, let's let's just let's just play this one out. We've got we've got history here, pal. We're in the ninth right. episode. We need to innovate. So this is the attempt to innovate. Um, five nine uh, probably most recently made its big headlines because it was acquired for fourteen point seven billion dollars by Zoom, and we'll talk more about Zoom a little bit here and later in the show. But had its big CX summit event. Pat, you and I attended. Got to listen to CEO Roland Trollope and the executive team talk. Company is in the process of really trying to, to show the market that, you know, voice is still cool. So while you and I here, by the way, follows the theme of call-in, follows the theme of podcasting, um, you and I like to do video. We like to add and multicast and, and, and give people what they want in whatever channel they want. But in reality, when we really need service, so you're thinking about the contact center world where Five9 plays in the cloud, it really is all about being able to quickly deliver resolutions to people's challenges, right? Whether that's, uh, you know, you're calling in to figure out where your missing orders are. You're calling in to figure out uh, how to get support on a product or service. In most cases, we, we don't want to jump on video. It's still fairly, uh, that's still, it's still a fairly archaic kind of interaction. We, maybe because of the pandemic, are more open than in the past to letting people look in our family rooms, living rooms, and kitchens. But at the same time, we just want resolution. We want to know, where's that order? When's it going to get here? Uh, how do I get this fixed? How do I get this up and running? And Five9 is really working on building the technology, the platform, the automation to utilize voice and to still enable uh, people and companies to get to that resolution more quickly in a more streamlined manner. And that was really the theme I took away here from the Five9 Summit is you can do it using modernization like cloud. You can do it at scale, but you can do it using Kind of communications and technologies that most of the market wants and that's fast and i actually pat you know while this is a fairly quick and, and simple topic for us to get on and get 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 past um here on the show is that i actually think it's going to be a voice only it's going to then evolve to and we're already seeing this voice and chat meaning people would prefer if they can't get voice they prefer to chat and those two are going to become increasingly uh interchangeable depending on the demographic of who's looking for support 
people are going to want to lead with chat or lead with voice. And video, while I do see continued integrations into CX platforms to enable a quick launch of a video to help someone with something more technical or something that needs to be viewed, I actually think that's going to be the third choice and it's going to be more specialized. So it's kind of interesting what's going on here because 5.9 is sort of is really pushing its roots, pushing the ability to get quick resolution through a voice platform. But at the same time, with the Zoom acquisition out there, you do have to think there's going to be much bigger integrations, especially with Zoom making such a big bet in how it's going to make its platform more extensible, more horizontal, and of course, compete with Slack Force, Salesforce and Slack. And then of course, Microsoft Teams and all that is being built around that platform. Yeah, that's good. Good analysis, Daniel. And this this might sound like heresy, but you know, to be honest with you, I think that um, there's more you can do with machine learning and audio than you can with video. I mean, you know, imagine if we went on mute and you know, Zoom or a company had to just do something with video. What are they going to do? Read our lips or something like that? I mean, maybe. You know, maybe that would improve uh, cognition or, or something like that. So if, if you look at the value, I think there's actually more value in the context of a call center with audio than there is video. Um, the second thing that really came out of the show was automation, which says, OK, you get all of this intelligence out of massaging uh, the voice data. Now, what do you do? Right. You want automatic uh, call changes. You want automatically information to come up. You want automatic uh, stuff to happen um, through these cues. And automation is the way uh, way to do that. And, you know, low code, no code type of, of things are really the way to go as opposed to, you know, diving in and, you know, editing 100,000 lines of code. That's just ugly. And there aren't enough programmers to do that. So, uh, and I'll be honest, until I started to do, you know, I've, I've done some analysis on some other companies like 8x8 uh, and, and folks like that. And, and recently, Mitel, um, I, I think 5 um, has got some really interesting uh, stuff. And I mean, it's crystal clear what Zoom's going to do with them, right? Uh, Zoom uh, kind of really didn't have a contact center uh, offering, and now they do. Zoom was super focused on what you could do with video, not really the AI portion. They weren't doing any tricks with uh, video, and this brings uh, an AI capability to uh, uh, to their portfolio. And of course, it brings Rowan. Yeah, that's great, Pat. We could spend a little bit more time talking about all the converging forces of, of collaboration and contact center, CDP, CRM. The platform is evolving. And there is a very interesting uh, set of developments that are creating new landscapes of competition. Uh, we got to move on to the next one here, Mr. Moorhead. Um, let's talk about HPE. So a couple of different pieces of news. You know, we do cover earnings here on the show. It's the beacon moment of truth for companies, as you so prophetically say, sir, on the regular. Um, but not only did HPE have earnings yesterday after hours, and we had the chance to talk to their CFO, uh, get a little bit more insight from him, more insight, I like that. Um, but Thank you. the, <laughs> the uh, company also announced a multi-billion dollar win from the NSA, that's uh, pretty legit, and then closed uh, a recent orchestration platform that uh, had been purchased, Zerto, uh, all happening this week, big busy week for HPE, Pat. Yeah, it certainly was. And I think what we'll do is we'll, uh, in, in true spirit of what we do, we'll chop up uh, a couple of these. Uh, let, let me start off with uh, this NSA deal. So it's a $2 billion deal over 10 years. Uh, not a lot of detail. Uh, I'd be scared if we had a lot of detail because it's the NSA. But um, it's uh, essentially um, um, an as a service, high performance computing deal. Okay. Uh, but I, I, the big picture here, to, to me, is two things. So first of all, uh, as a service matters, because my guess is, is is if HP didn't offer this, you know, or, or Dell didn't, let's say, have, have Apex, this would 100% chance have gone to a public cloud player, okay? I view this as a loss for an AWS, uh, a Google Cloud, uh, an Azure, uh, something like that. Um, so 
you know, I, I can't help but to think, is this kind of the beginning of the uh, the ec somewhat of equity between the public cloud and the hybrid uh, as a service from the traditional uh, players? So interesting stuff uh, out there. And as I think you'll go through the earnings, that doesn't necessarily show that now is the time uh, for that based on uh, based on revenue growth. Uh, but uh, the other deal uh, that was the other thing that uh, related to HP that came out this week, a lot of news, by the way, in one week, I think they could have uh, spread it out there was the uh, the closing of uh, the Zerto deal. So uh, Zerto is a cloud native aware data protection and resilience that's going to get sucked right into uh, HPE GreenLake. It's something you have to have, um, and I'm just, I'm just boggled at the speed of HPE's acquisitions and integrations. Uh, so, from a, a a revenue standpoint, they're a lot smaller than some of the other players. And you know, early analysis that I made was I was very clear: it has to operate five to ten times faster than Dell and Cisco and even Lenovo to to make a difference. Uh, and the second thing they needed to do, and this was regarding Dell, was to have software capabilities that people actually wanted to invest in. And, and I think that we've seen this, whether you know it's, it's virtualized environments, uh, containerized based, uh, and then going to the app level where they added um, even to the vertical apps like Epic uh, for, for healthcare. So that's that how did they do this quarter daniel yeah so uh, interestingly on zerto i just want to make one last point i'll jump in i think there's like a category here what do we what do we how do you dump that in is it operations orchestration it ops orchestra i don't know i just i, I was thinking a lot about that as you were talking I'm, I, yeah. what, are we, what are we calling this these it's days? it's it's in the it's in the storage uh area data protection okay dp yeah just, just trying to give it a, I want to, you know, you know, we are, we like to give everything a label. Um, yeah. So HPE had a very interesting result this quarter. Um, it came right in on, on, on the level of expectations. Uh, you know, there's like this two uh, sort of converging forces in the marketplace. One is there's always that top line number that everybody immediately looks at and says, how fast are they growing? Um, and then there's the context. And I think I want to just quickly touch on both. And the top line, the company grew about 1% year over year. Uh, at first glance, people are like, 1%, uh, is that exciting? Should I be happy? But first of all, the company came in line. Second of all, HPE uh, uh, and Cisco and some of these big IT OEMs, they were hit pretty hard by the pandemic. So this comeback, it's, it's supply chain impacted. It's uh, return to work impacted. It's also you've got a company that's in a business transformation moving from big CapEx sales to more and more as a service revenues. So you've got these different forces going on. So at the top line, it's like, yeah, they're doing okay. Um, but when you get underneath the surface, that's where I think the story about HPE becomes more interesting. There was a couple of encouraging top line data points. Like one, their order uh, growth is happening a lot faster than their revenue growth. Their order growth came in at 11%. Companies doing a really good job creating op -ink. Their Their profitability was up year over year by 28%. So it shows they're operating very efficiently. They also mentioned during this earnings call that they're reinstating share repurchases, which is always a good indicator that the company feels it's undervalued and it's going to start reinvesting in its, itself and, and support the investors that have stuck with the company throughout this pandemic. From a business uh, and operational standpoint, um, you know, the core businesses are looking pretty encouraging. Pat, you mentioned the $2 billion NSA deal. That's a lot of HPC. That part of the business has, has seemingly been pretty strong. I think they're targeting over 8% growth. The other part that has been really robust has been the intelligent edge. That saw year over year revenue go up by over 20%. I think it was 23% in that business unit. One of the right. most encouraging year over year growth stories for the company. But let's be honest, Pat, the whole story, the big kazoo uh, was Antonio Neri in 2019, got up on the stage, said, we're going all in on everything as a service. God, he was all in again. That's great. Um, everything as a service and the whole company by 2022. Well, listen, we're in the like eighth inning of 2021 now. So it's time to sort of hold the feet to the fire. Did the company make this transition into 2022 and how is that going? So 
to achieve the goals for revenue and growth that Neary set out, the company needed to be hitting 30 to 40% growth on a, on a quarterly basis year over year. This quarter, it once again did do that. It came in at 33%, so right in the range. And maybe the look forward encouraging number, Pat, was the 46% growth in the as a service order volume. They also have over 1,100 customers now participating in this GreenLight as a service ecosystem. And the contract value of this uh, business has now reached over $5.4 billion. So, you know, for, for HPE, that's the number to watch. That's the story. You know, growth in the edge, good. IoT, good. HPC, good. But this, the whole foundation of the company going forward goes back to Antonio Neri's 2019 Discover presentation where he said, we're going to be everything as a service in three years. Three years is coming. The numbers so far are encouraging, but you know, again, 5.4 billion um, need to keep pushing that 30 to 40% growth over the next few quarters to show it's executing, but it's been encouraging so far, getting that top line back into seven, eight, 9% along, you know, closer to where ISG from Dell is and where Cisco is these last quarters, I think is going to be important to give confidence to the outsiders. But some of these numbers beneath that top line are the ones that those that really follow the company should feel encouraged by. All right, so I'm going to move on. I almost gave you the host duties there. I was going to pause there and let you take me to the next topic. But let's let's uh, take you to the next topic. Let's take me to the next topic that we can talk about together. Let's talk about yeah. AI and Google announcing a tie up together. Um, Pat, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about it from the C3 AI angle. I know you follow Google Cloud very closely, so I'm gonna I'll, I'll pitch that back your way a little bit here. So C3 AI, um, interesting company. It's still in its fairly early days, but it is one of the only companies out there that has truly hung its hat on what would be considered enterprise artificial intelligence built for industry. So Tom Siebel, the founder and CEO of C3, um, you know he's pretty much a legend in CRM. That's what you probably know him for, Siebel Systems, early Oracle days, really being one of the, the, the people behind the development of CRM. Well, the opportunity he's identified is, is, is effectively that, C, that AI is not going to be a, so much a technology layer driven by IT, but it's going to be a business layer driven by the data science side that's going to be early supporting some of the most highly regulated industries, defense, aerospace, oil and gas, um, and, and uh, financial sector, healthcare. You have massive influxes of data in these industries that's scaling exponential on a daily basis that all needs to somehow be managed. You need to create algorithms. You need to be able to do this at scale. And not every company has endless resources to hire mountains of data scientists to actually figure out what are the right things to be checking to get the constant drip of insights from all that data. And that's really what the company is doing is it's building these these prepackaged software suites that can basically do things like, you know, monitoring a field full of sensors in, in, in the oil and gas industry or being able to monitor millions of transactions concurrently for fraud. Well, streamlining this so a bank doesn't have to necessarily build that from scratch, but can instead turn to C3AI. Um, only at this time on about a quarter billion dollar a year revenue rate early, but only 98 customers, Pat, 98 customers. And by the way, 200 million of its revenue came from a tie up with Microsoft and working with Microsoft to vertically integrate uh, with its customers. Now it's announcing this Google tie up, which is really interesting. And Pat, I think you follow, like I said, Google Cloud really closely, but with Google's accelerated efforts and investments and growth, I think it could be a really interesting one. And Tom Siebel told me, he said, he thinks it could be as good, if not better, than the Microsoft type in terms of revenue generation for the company. Daniel, um, I wasn't, uh, I was a little surprised about this one. You know, Google is diving very, uh, two things. First off, Google itself is diving in vertically, big time, right? Um, and, you know, why do I, you know, why did it need a partner to do this? Secondly, the sweet spot for Google Cloud is AI and ML and data, right? And that's exactly, and C3 does vertical, big data and machine learning and AI stuff. So I was a little surprised and I don't know if this pretends to maybe an acquisition uh, for C3 AI or, you know, and, and given the work that C3 did with Azure, I'm assuming that C3 isn't locked into using Google technology, right? They seem to be, 
kind of IaaS independent. Okay. Uh, so anyways, kind of a head scratcher for me. Uh, pragmatically, I understand it for both companies. It gets Google going quicker. Uh, it gets C3 going quicker. But then again, um, they're splitting the revenue maybe. <laughs> right. Uh, so anyways, uh, maybe we'll see how this works out and uh, financially for both the companies. I wasn't aware that C3 had so few customers, but um, I, I totally, uh, I think I, I get it from their side. I guess I don't understand it from Google's side. So I have to yeah. do some uh, research on that. Yeah, well, it's something maybe we come back to. It's an interesting one, Pat, and I think you made a good assessment. Small number of customers, large revenue per customer. I think one is operating more at the technology layer and one is operating more at the business layer, but I think Google is making some serious investments um, hiring a lot of people into their cloud business with, with great vertical expertise. Kind of reminds me a little bit, almost, I don't know if it's safe to say this, but SAP-esque. You know, SAP has lagged in many ways on the technologies uh, in the cloud migration that some of the other companies have been able to do faster, but has really won by the fact that they've had so much business line expertise um, that it's, kept, you know, it's like, where are the decisions being driven, Pat? Is it being driven by the business or is it being driven by technology? And it seems that business often wins when those two compete. Um, but obviously more and more it's symbiotic. Um, like I said, I, I, I think it's one that we can definitely come back to. A real encouraging piece of news that broke this week, um, Amazon. So, you know, you and I have a lot of these discussions. Amazon is constantly in the crosshairs. People like to pick on it, but you know, I always say people like to pick on winners and Amazon is a winner. Um, this week it announced a, another massive corporate hiring. So these aren't, these aren't jobs at fulfillment centers. These are corporate jobs in tech and in, in administrative roles uh, and 40,000 more employees, Pat. Yeah, you forgot one thing. P people also like to pick on companies that are making a lot of money as if there's something something wrong with that as well. <laughs> is, is winner, is, was winner not, I was, I was too indiscriminate uh, with that one, huh? Well, they're they're still picking on uh, Bezos, even even though he's not even technically CEO of Amazon anymore. I mean, he's he's chairman of the board, so I guess it still matters. But uh, they're still uh, uh, coming after him big time. Uh, so hey, let's move to kind of what's going on here. So on the heels of Amazon adding four hundred and fifty thousand uh, employees, uh, more for their uh, distribution centers than, than anything else. And by the way, those were, uh, at, you know, Bernie Sanders, uh, requested, uh, $15 per hour, uh, full medical, uh, health benefits, uh, 401k, 20 weeks of paid leave for new parents, uh, subsidized job training that includes that on the heels of that, uh, Amazon had a career fair and at the career fair, they are offering, 40,000, I would call it more information worker uh, jobs uh, around the globe, uh, engineers, uh, HR, uh, finance, uh, marketing. And it's going to happen on September uh, 15th. Uh, it's open to the public, uh, 220 locations uh, around the world. Uh, and by the way, you know, I, I think I already gave my editorial and opinion uh, 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 beforehand, but uh, what I like about this is the 450,000 uh, were mostly distribution center workers. These 40,000 employees uh, are, are coming in there to, to even grow even more because you do need you do need OPEX, right? And, and management uh, for uh, to manage uh, the size of the business they have. And I think it's a it's a good thing because this indicates to me that their business would go up because these these are the last kind of people you would hire, right? Um, because they're administrative folks, aside from the the engineers, right? That's down in that, that R&D line. But I think what this says is, okay, we know you're working hard, but we see even more growth coming up in the pipeline and we're gonna bring in more people to support that. So I think that's a positive sign. Yeah, Pat, I, I, you know, good coverage from your end. Um, I read your commentary about it. Very good. You know, you and I, there's not a debate to be had here. We share a similar view. 
of the positives of this. This is the world that we live in. Amazon is a rapidly growing company. It, it is owning up the responsibilities that come with that to, to push for higher wages, to push for greater benefits. You and I have been to the facilities. We've seen the environments. We've, we've, we've looked at you know all the safety and considerations given to employees. And, and that goes across the board. And by the way, we also know people throughout the organization, Pat. And, you know, I always say that culture is one of those things that you really get the best sense of it. And in, in, when you're talking in the back room and you're having a beer with somebody and you just look at their face when you talk to them, whether it's during a meeting or, on, you know, just having a personal conversation. And, and by and large, my experience with people that are there, they're happy. They, they, they're enjoying their experience and they're growing. And if they do leave, it's usually they're leaving because they've got a great uh, resume they've built while they're there and they've been brought in to do a big job somewhere because of the experience that they've, they've garnered it, you know, one of the world's, one of the world's largest companies by market cap and of course uh, by name. So good news. Always love seeing jobs being added to the economy, especially with some of these recent jobs reports being less than impressive given the circumstances and all of the openings that are out there. Um, so let's wrap up here, Pat. Let's zoom, zoom into the finish. Let's uh, zoom, zoom, zoom. Uh, right up to the end and talk about Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. So Zoom, um, I like your Chiron. It, it's funny, Zoom bombs earnings or was it, did it, did it, was it? Um, Pat, early this week, Zoom reported 54% um, growth, its first billion dollar revenue quarter, and it landed in the market with uh, anything but a bomb. It was a thud. It was an absolute... Um, it was an absolute wailing. Uh, I remember watching it after hours, falling five, six, seven. I think it, it dropped over 12% after hours from sitting around 350 to 300. And remember, this is a stock that was getting close to 600 at the peak of, of pandemic times. Um, this is a company that's done nothing but grow. And it's seen almost a 40 and now a 50% retracement from its, from its highs. Uh, so the question isn't really so much about um, should it be 300, 400 or 500 uh, dollar stock? Because, again, that's not really what we do here. But the question is, is this still a company that's super viable and that people should be excited about because of the innovation and in technology? And what in the numbers really warranted that kind of pullback? The pullback that long and short came because of the the guidance. They, they're guiding more towards like a 25 percent growth next quarter. But remember, we're now in pandemic times uh, where their pandemic quarters are being being judged against other pandemic quarters. So 2018, this company did about $200 million in revenue total. Now you're talking about a company that by the 2021 is doing a billion dollars a quarter. That is rocket fuel for growth. And, and, and people are like, huh. So it went up, it went up, it went up. And now at 54% and a billion dollar a quarter run rate with a billion dollar guidance into the next quarter, people are like, oh, that's not good enough. But normal had to come back at some point. We, we dealt with a cataclysmic likely once in a lifetime event that drove the acceleration of Zoom. So some of its growth maybe warranted a pullback. I think that's what that 40% was. But in, in, in the rest of it, it's like, is the company doing well? And it's like, yeah, it's doing well. It's got triple digit revenue expansion, over 130% revenue expansion of, of companies with over 10 employees for 13 straight quarters. That means its companies are spending more money. It's grown to over 2,200 hundred thousand dollar a year customers that are spending money with them that's great robust reliable recurring revenue pat and over five hundred thousand paying customers at this point it just spent 14.7 billion on on, on five nine which we talked about earlier it's it's horizontal it's going horizontal with its platform it's building a platform with apps and integration a lot to like i'll give you one concern and then i'll pass this back to you my one big concern is Zoom is going to have to really figure out its approach to dealing with these new operating systems for work. These operating systems for work that are Teams, that are Slack, where video is a capability, but it's not the epicenter of the business anymore. I think async, you could argue, is the asynchronous communications is really the epicenter of our business. Pat, right? Like you and I chat on WebEx, right? It's when we do it when we have time and it's on demand. And I think a lot of work is like that. Now we're seeing that getting tied in with platform. We're getting it tied in with data. We're seeing it get tied in with ERP, CRM, back office, CX. How does Zoom through strategic integrations? Because who, who, who are they going to buy at this point that's going to organic, inorganically bring in ERP and CRM and that whole stack and still be competitive? 
Or, you know, does it get wrapped up in a company like an Oracle that wants to actually bring them in and build something competitive to them? But I think at this point, Zoom is the acceleration is so fast, the growth is so fast, it would be so expensive to, to do a deal like that, that I think they're going to have to do it through a bunch of inter, interconnects and, and, and strategic partnerships. But that is my one concern. But it was a really good quarter. The sell-off, I, I just can't get there. Uh, Zoom is up 382% uh, in the past few years. Huge. And I think you have different types of investors who jump on a stock. I mean, you have retail, you have uh, the big names that are a little bit less conservative, and then you've got the 401k folks who are super conservative. Uh, I think the reaction to this is, are the retail folks? which, you know, who may have jumped on early, made some good money, and just wanted to hold on until a certain point. And I think those retail folks are, are jumping off here. Uh, anybody who expected the growth to continue at that rate is a fool, right? And, and quite frankly, I don't know if you want them investing in your stock because uh, they really don't believe in it. Uh, to your point of integration into full suites, uh, I hear you there. I, I totally thought they would make a play for Slack, right? Or they would merge. You know, it was funny. Uh, I had thought before the pandemic hit that Slack would end up buying Zoom. That's before, you know, its valuation skyrocketed so much. And then Slack ended up getting uh, bought by Salesforce. So I think that um, I think they do have to figure out the, the sweet thing. But if I know these guys, uh, I think that they're going to first try to build a very high quality yet simple uh, chat. By the way, they, they have a chat, and I, I mean even beyond the video app itself. Yeah. But I don't think very many people even even know it's there. But, but I think they're going to try to make a run uh, with that uh, because, as we know, it's all about the data. But it is funny, though. Uh, if you think about email, I mean, the same concerns that I have about uh, Salesforce, right? It's like uh, a lot of the data is sitting in email. And, and how does Salesforce get access to that? How does Zoom get access to all that information uh, in email uh, and chat? You know, uh, and, and at least the way their, their privacy and security goes, they, they don't even get access to uh, the information in the video. So... Interesting strategic stuff here, Daniel, but uh, overall, I think it was just a uh, complete uh, overreaction. I think we agree. I think that's good. And I think we're at time. So I want to say a good thank you, uh, Patrick, uh, Mr. Moorhead, more insights and strategy. I'm going to knock that one out in the end. Great job today. Always great to have you and me get together for this pod. One of my favorite parts of every single week. Everybody out there, I want to say thank you for tuning into this episode, hit that subscribe button. Join us, uh, join us on Spotify, Apple, YouTube. Follow us on Twitter. The good goes to me, the bad goes to Pat. And now I believe you're gonna be able to follow us on Colin and we're, we're gonna be all in on Colin. We're gonna figure out how to do that. Uh, maybe we'll have to reach back out. Uh, you might have to reach back out to, to Mr. Sachs and ask him what his ideas are, but you and I are technical, we can figure it out. But anyways, for this show, time to say goodbye. We'll see you later. Until next time.